Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we approach your throne this morning, thankful for this day of life and the opportunity that we have to be gathered together as your sons and daughters that we might study a portion of your word. Father, as we go throughout this period of study, we pray that all things are a true account and that our minds are open even more to the first century world and the world prior to where your people live, that we might be able to better understand the people of the book. Forgive us where we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So just uh, real quick, when you know I was looking at it, um, when we're done with section one, uh, which is the kind of Old Testament slash intertestamental period, the notes will be made available, but they're more than likely just going to be made available uh, through the members uh, section uh, of the website. If you're not sure how to access that or, or what have you, just get with Barry. He can let you know. If you if you don't have a printer or can't, then, then I could certainly make that available. Part of the reason being is because I think when we're done with section one, there's, there's going to be a minimum of about 70 pages worth of notes at, at a minimum. So it, it would be a a big cost to have them printed somewhere else and even here with ink and paper and and everything it, it would be quite a lot but if you if you do need a copy uh, and can't get online then then we can still make that happen so don't worry about that um, also in in looking at it we it may be extended beyond the quarter but only by one month just to make sure that that we kind of hit all the points that, that I'd like us to hit uh, refreshing last week, just very quickly, you know, we, uh, we've been going over the different empires. We really started with the Medo-Persian and then uh, and dealing with Xerxes. We talked about Esther. And then last week, we looked really somewhat at Alexander the Great and talked about his conquest and Tyre. Uh, there we go. Is that better? Was it was I not close enough before? Okay, um, and talked about his conquest of Tyre and how he took the ruins of the old city. Remember, we had read the prophecy in Ezekiel, and he had taken the ruins of the old city and built this kind of bridge, this causeway out, and leveled the rest of it. Then went to Jerusalem and ended up uh, paying homage to Jedua, who was the high priest there because of a vision that he had seen in Dios. So what I wanted us to do uh, this beginning this week was to put a pause, uh, just stick a pin in dealing with the kingdoms. Uh, and so we could look at the synagogues, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they're all coming up during this time period and a little bit before. And then once we've looked at the synagogues, Pharisees, and Sadducees, we'll pick back up with the kingdoms and start looking at Rome. Uh, so uh, I want us to kind of pause where we are, look at those things, and, and then we'll move into Rome. And part of the reason for that is because Rome is obviously... Uh, what uh, Christ and the apostles are living under, so we need to kind of deal with some things before, before that. Did anybody have anything to add to what we've looked at thus far regarding the, the history? Okay. Uh, like I've said before, I know that history is not necessarily a favorite subject uh, of many people, but for us to be good Bible students. You know, we want to do our best to try to see things through the eyes of the people, and this, I believe, will, will help us do that. So, but before looking at the synagogue, we have to consider what they were replacing and why. What they were replacing and why. And that leads us to the first temple. Uh, we're not going to go into the subject extensively, uh, for our study due to time limitations. We're only going to consider really what is necessary. Um, so we're going to be looking at, at that first temple. If you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 17. 
Now, in looking at the temple and the synagogues, it's probably going to be this week and next week, simply because of the fact that there, there's more reading uh, in this. But we do want to do Bible things by Bible ways and look at Scripture wherever we can, which is why we considered in the first lesson looking at Daniel and then when we were looking at Ezekiel last week, Esther the week before that, and so what have you. So First Chronicles chapter 17. First Chronicles chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, reading through verse 5. Uh, this is where David's thoughts turn toward building a temple that's suitable for God. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now when David lived in his house, David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, it is not you who will build me a house to dwell in. For I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up Israel to this day. But I have gone from tent to tent and from dwelling to dwelling. So now let's fast forward a little bit to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles 28. So... First Chronicles 17, we have that David has set his mind. He said, look, I'm actually dwelling in a house. But the ark, God, is, is dwelling in tents. That's really not appropriate. He wants to build a house. And so then we fast forward to First Chronicles chapter 28 and verses 2 through 7. Does someone mind reading that? First Chronicles 28, verses 2 through 7. Through seven, through verse seven. Okay. So we have 1 Chronicles 17 that David sets his mind to build a house for God. And God says through the prophet Nathan, no. We fast forward to 1 Chronicles 28 and David is recounting that Solomon, his son, is in fact the one that's cho chosen to build uh, the Lord's house. This would be the, the first temple. Uh, and uh, Historically, is that from the year 1000 BC to 586 BC is known as the first temple period, and we are go going to get to its destruction. But l look at verse 7 again. I will establish his kingdom forever if he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules as he is today. So let's add another side to verse 7 by reading from 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, if you would like to. Uh, if you'd like to turn there. Second Samuel chapter 7 specifically. Yes. Second Samuel chapter 7.
And again, all of these uh, references and more are provided in the, the notes that you'll get. But 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he, so, that, so we're familiar with that already from 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 7. Right? I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But then there's a little more detail added. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. Okay? So we have, after David, Solomon became king. He reigned, he reigned for about 40 years uh, or so. And conventional dates... Uh, put his reign from about 970 BC to 931, and, and that's going to be important here in, in a few moments. During that time, he took 20 years to build two houses, the king's house and the Lord's house. Seven of those years were just spent on, on building the, the Lord's house, and we have that in, in 1 Kings chapter, chapter 6. But... And I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with this. Solomon's account is both one of, of grandeur and, and tragedy, right? He did build the first temple as God had instructed, um, but he became increasingly sinful as time progressed as well. Uh, and he, he made alliances with foreign nations. He married uh, foreign women. Let's just go ahead and turn over to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, and when you get there, if someone would like to go ahead and read verses 1 through 8. Thank you very much for, for reading that and everyone who, who's read thus far. So prior to getting into the synagogues, uh, uh, again, we have to look at why they were there to begin with. Wh what is it that happened? Now, we have David wanting to build the house. He said, no, that Solomon's going to build the house. And then we have Solomon spending seven years just building the house of God, and we have this account of him taking foreign women. Now, do you remember what the Lord told David about Solomon that we just read? Uh, okay. If not, because I, I know that it's a lot of reading. First Chronicles 28, 7, I will establish his kingdom forever if... If he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules as he is today. And then 2 Samuel 7, 14, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, 
I will discipline him with the rod of men. See, the temple was a dwelling place for God, and Solomon knew this. He knew that it was a dwelling place for God. In fact, over in verse 5 of what Brother Israel just read, uh, the uh, goddess of the Sidonians, Ashereth, she was thought to be God's wife. And so they worshipped her alongside Yahweh in Yahweh's own house. Even Solomon was doing that, as it says that he was making sacrifices to their gods. So you imagine David, sinful person, sure he made mistakes, but still called a man after God's own heart, who had it in, in his mind that I'm living in a house, God's dwelling in a tent, let me build something for him. And God says, no, your son will. The son spends all this time doing it. He knows what the, the rules are, so to speak. He knows what the commandments of God are and that they are not to marry uh, foreign women for this reason. He does it anyways. That's exactly what happens. And he starts worshiping other gods in God's house at the same time that he's trying to worship God. Imagine in this auditorium, if it were filled up and you've got this row of people over here praising God, and at this the same time you've got these people over in this row. Now y'all personally don't think it, but y'all in this row praising the devil. That, that's, the, that's the mentality that the people had. They were of a divided mind, right? A lesson for us today as Christians is that we are, in a sense, sometimes, some are more guilty than others, doing the same thing. That we praise God on Sunday and worship the devil during the week. There's a lot of people that are like that. I'm sorry? By right. By, by our activities and, and, you know, I'm not saying anybody's broken out of content, you know, a, a copy of LaVey's Satanic Bible or anything, but by, by the way that we act, right? So there, there is a lesson there. But the temple was a dwelling place for God. Solomon knew this. Let's go back to 1 Kings uh, chapter 8. So just a, a couple of pages back from, from where we are. Now this is what Solomon said at the dedication of, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, I'll begin reading in verse 10. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has, has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel while all of the assembly of Israel stood. Verse 15. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord, uh, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, nevertheless, you shall not build my house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord fulfilled his promise that he had made for I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and I have built the house for the name of the Lord the God of Israel so Solomon knew exactly what was going on he knew the purpose to build this house he knew that he was fulfilling prophecy and what Nathan had told David and yet he still went against the commands of God, married foreign women, worshipped false gods and all of these idols. God intended for this place, to, for his house to be a place of, 
of sacrifice. Does someone mind reading 1 Kings uh, chapter 8 where we are, but just verse 62, and then if someone else could get 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 12. So verse 62 is 1 Kings 8, and then 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. Thank you. Second Chronicles 7 and verse 12. Okay. So we have that God intended his house to be a place of sacrifice, a place of reverent worship. You know, First Kings chapter 8, verse 63 tells us, says Solomon sacrificed 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep, right? At this, at this dedication ceremony, it would be the destination where people would travel for their three pilgrimage feasts that were commanded by God back in Exodus. It, it was a national identity, uh, of the of the Jewish people there's no doubt that Solomon through the writings of Moses the prophets and others he knew what the purpose of the temple was and yet now we have a man foretold by pro or in prophecy that he would be the one to build the temple and not his father David who after much time and effort threw it all away he threw it all away, and just as God has spoken in 2 Samuel, the rod of men was now upon him. So we have that he, he began a good work. He began doing a good thing in trying to serve God. And God said, God said, if he continues keeping my statutes, I'll establish his kingdom forever. But if he sins, if there is iniquity found in him, if he keeps sinning, then I will discipline him with the rod of men. And so that's where we're going to start coming into the, the, the synagogues here. So after seeing the temple built and the man who worked for seven out of 20 years in its construction, who went from righteous to unrighteous, we're going to start looking at the rod of men and the synagogues. But before we get into that section, were there any comments or or questions or thoughts. Yes, sir. It, it would have been, um, we also have to consider the time that they're living in. You know, now when we think sorcery, for example, we think, you know, Harry Potter, make-believe, you know, that type of thing, right? Um, then it was very real. You know, for, for example, Moses and Aaron, when they go to Pharaoh and he's performing these things, well, the first several signs, Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the exact same thing, right? Uh, we have the Witch of Endor and, and others. So it was a very real thing. So that was some of the things. Uh, then you also have to consider the wiles of women, <laughs> you know, uh, can be very convincing. <laughs> Look, that, that was the nicest way that I could put it, okay, Miss Peggy? <laughs> um,
Sure, it, I agree. It definitely would, would have been smarter for him to try to indoctrinate them uh, or teach them. And as far as we know, he he did. We, you know, we we don't have a clue. Uh, at the same time, I also know women who you can't convince to go to a specific restaurant. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it really depends on uh, on the person, the individual, and, and who knows what what was going on. But no, I, I absolutely agree. But there is also um, a lesson for us in that the New Testament tells us that the wisdom of men, which is what Solomon had, you know, that the wisdom of men is foolishness with God. To show that even the wisest king, even the richest man, even the one who would end up writing Ecclesiastes and saying, I've had this, 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 and this, all is vanity. It's all pointless. So um, he may have, we have no idea uh, because we don't have the record. We just know that, that he did end up turning, uh, you know, away from God. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's a lot missing. But a lesson for us in the sense that even the wisest man among us is still capable of great sin. All right. Uh, any other thoughts or, or comments? Good thoughts. Okay. So Babylon and the synagogues. Now, if you remember our first lesson, we really skipped over Babylon and jumped straight into the second empire, the Medo-Persian empire and, and uh, dealing with, uh, with Xerxes and what have you. So we're going to go back and look a little bit at Babylon. You'll remember them uh, from the first lesson that they were the, uh, the empire that was the head of gold on the statue uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted for him, that he told him the dream and interpreted this great statue in Daniel chapter 2. Um, so they were the head of gold, and in chapter 4 of Daniel, when it's talking about the beasts, that were there, they were also the, the first beast. But So in December of 589 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar, who we visited a little bit early, earlier in the lesson, he began this 30 month, this two and a half year siege against Jerusalem. Uh, the Jews had been worshiping God as well as other pagan deities uh, there at the temple. Uh, the city of David, it was a, in a horrible situation. In fact, the Bible describes the situation uh, in Jerusalem in a couple of ways. In 2 Kings chapter 25, 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse 3, it says, On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. You think of a city being under siege is that most rulers who care for their people are going to take those that are living outside of the city walls and in farmland, they're going to have them come in, you know, bring their crops in, bring their families in, in within the city walls for more protection. Here is that it was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And Lamentations chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5, it says, The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who are brought up in purple, which was a, a color of royalty. Uh, you may think that when Christ uh, was being taunted by the guards, how they put on uh, this, this colored robe, but those who are brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. You know, they were having to, as people died from famine, they were having to burn them uh, within the city walls uh, to prevent them from, you know, the smell and decomposition and, and what have you. So, and then Lamentations 4 and verse 9, Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. The people had been brought in from outside the city walls. They had brought in grain and fruits and all of these things, but there were too many people. They, they had eaten it all. There was now a famine in the land. Um, and, uh, you know, w w women know if they're not uh, getting nourishment themselves, 
then they cannot nurse newborn children. You know, you have children that are dying, you know, the, their tongue is sticking to the roof of their mouth. They're having to burn bodies in various places in the city just to prevent disease. I mean, it's a horrible situation. All because one guy who even built the Lord's house started worshiping other gods. If he had just followed God's commands to begin with, then God would have established his kingdom forever. But he had to marry all of these different women, worship their gods, and now the rod of men comes. Now, after the fall of Jerusalem, we may actually get through all of this today. Some of y'all said, Amen. But after the fall of Jerusalem, the Babylonian general, Nebuzaradan, so kind of like Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan, he plundered the city and destroyed Solomon's temple. The Babylonians, they had utterly destroyed Jerusalem. But King Nebuchadnezzar, he allowed some people to stay behind. The Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah chapter 52 and verse 16 for those taking notes. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. And that was Jeremiah 52 and verse 16. So some of the people were left behind. Not everybody went into uh, Babylonian captivity. So with the establishment of the temple built by Solomon, the days of the portable tabernacle were gone. Right? It was no longer God dwelling in tents since he had been brought out from Egypt. We have the temple built. That's where God is dwelling now. And now the temple is destroyed because of this man. So after the fall of Jerusalem, at that, as it fell at the hands of the Babylonian army, a new problem faced God's people. Worship and sacrifices. Now, we have today houses of worship on almost every corner in the United States. Okay? Eliminate them all but one. And everybody is of the same faith, pretty much. You have people who aren't, but they're not worried about going there anyways. So imagine that you take everyone who believes in the biblical God, member of the church or member of denomination, whatever, but everyone who believes in a biblical God, and they are going to this one house of worship in all of the United States. You need to go there at least three times a year. That's what's commanded for, for the good Jews to do, right? And then you get word that it has been burned to the ground. What are you to do? That was God's house. It's where they would travel and they would sing the Psalms uh, of David and uh, others. And that, that's the way that they memorized uh, those Psalms, but, but now it's gone. Right? So that, that's a new problem that, that faced them. And so we want to kind of look at the synagogues in ancient times. And we consider ancient times because in Acts 15, in Acts chapter 15 and verse 21, it reads, For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now, the synagogues that is mentioned in Acts 15, that's not saying there were synagogues in Moses' time. It's talking that Moses had established by God's command that his law was to be read in every city. So now that there are synagogues, that's where God's law is. But we're still kind of looking in the meantime. And uh, so it's the notation there of ancient generations, the Jewish people's circumstances, that the belief of the synagogues, the origin of the synagogues, that it occurred during the Babylonian captivity. Now, we want to look a little bit closer at this, at this establishment, which began before the word became flesh, Psalm 1 and verse 14, and they continue even today. Uh, but before we get into the, this a little bit more, were there any other questions or, or comments so far?
Yeah, I hope you're not disappointed at the end of this when we're talking about synagogues. I know some of you might be. That's okay. But the word synagogue is not, as you may have guessed, Hebrew, though it does have Hebraic synonyms. Uh, the term synagogue is a Greek term from synagogue, and it means to bring together. It means a place of assembly. Okay? Um, uh, Jeremiah 39 8 references it as a house of the people. We may liken it to the term ecclesia. You know, you, you hear preachers and Bible class teachers, and you've, you've used it yourself, ecclesia, the called out, or, or the assembly, or something. It's a generic term. Ecclesia does not specifically refer to the church. It refers to an assembly of people, just like synagogue does not refer necessarily to God's house. It's, uh, the, it was used in this sense but in Greek because it was relating to the Jews. Um, traditionally, though the synagogue functioned as more of a house of worship, and for this reason, there, the people associated, there's three synonyms. Uh, I'll just, uh, I won't give the Hebrew names, those are in the notes. And it's difficult to pronounce anyways. But uh, a house of prayer, a house of assembly, and a house of study. Uh, first and foremost, regarding the synagogues, there's no mention of them in, in what is called the written Torah. The written Torah refers to the five books uh, of Moses at the beginning uh, of our Protestant Bibles. It's uh, not the oral, but the written. There's no mention of it in there. And its institution, its origin is really thought to be of rabbinic origin, meaning that rabbis kind of came up uh, with, this, with this idea. Right? So you have that God was dwelling in tents, you know, from the time the people were brought out of Egypt. Then there's the temple. The temple is destroyed. Some time passes. And they come up with this idea of a structure similar to the tents, similar to kind of a hybrid between the tents and the temple. But it remains unclear as to when the synagogues actually appeared in the Babylonian Empire. Uh, the oldest dated evidence that we have the, is the third century before Christ. Okay? I, I'm. It, that's the earliest physical evidence that we have is the third century before Christ. Um, but there are historical records that suggest its beginning was, was much uh, sooner. Um, there's a book by, uh, by Weingreen, uh, he, and he writes, The majority of writers on this subject have accepted as probable the assumption that sometime after the destruction of Jerus the Jerusalem temple in 586 BC and the transfer of a large portion of the Judean population to Babylon, because remember some were left behind, the synagogue was established in B Babylon by the Jewish exiles there. Some associate the rise of the synagogue with the resettlement of repatriated exiles in Judea. Following upon the enlightened edict of Cyrus, which permitted the return of the Judean exiles around 538 B.C. And we'll look at Cyrus a, a little bit more uh, later. Um, and we should note that before the temple, either the first temple that Solomon built or the second temple that, that Cyrus commanded to be built, much of the teaching occurred in private homes. Um, and that comes from the command found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 6 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. If you don't remember the reference, I'm sure you'll be familiar with it as soon as I start reading it. But it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So really, the initial purpose of the synagogue was as a place of worship. And it was a place of study as well, a place of prayer for the rabbis. Okay? And that, that develops over time. 
Now, Josephus, we've got a couple of moments here, so I might be able to get to a couple of these. Uh, Titus Flavius Josephus. Uh, we probably mainly recognize just the Josephus part, right? Uh, he is a Roman Jewish historian, uh, both in Jerusalem, and he's known primarily, like I said, as Josephus. He's our primary source outside uh, of the New Testament uh, when it comes to study, especially for synagogues during the time of Christ. Um, in his work, there's two works that he's primarily known by, the Antiquities of the Jews and, and the War of the Jews. And I just want to read a couple of excerpts here uh, regarding what he wrote on the synagogues. He is what most, con most religious scholars consider to be one of the greatest authorities on the history of the Jews. Simply, I mean, he was there when Titus went in and destroyed Jerusalem. He was there. Uh, he, w he had rebelled against Rome at one point, but then the, the people were so impressed with him that he took him in, and he, uh, they made him a Roman citizen and, and all of this. Yes, sir? Uh, I don't, uh, don't remember. Are you talking about birth, death? Uh, not sure offhand. Um, not sure offhand as to it. Um, I think it was around 90 or 100, something like that, as far as death goes. Um, but uh, regarding the synagogue, I might just get to this one, and then we'll finish up the others next week and start looking at the Pharisees. Uh, but regarding the synagogues on a weekly meeting place in his Antiquity of the Jews, and these references were in the notes as well, now the privileges we desire, even when we are in the best circumstances, are not such as deserve to be envied. For we are indeed in a prosperous state by your means, but this is only in common with others. And it is no more than this which we desire, to preserve our religion without any prohibition, which as it appears not in itself a privilege to be envied us, so it is for the advantage of those that grant it to us. For if the divinity delights in being honored, it must delight in those that permit them to be honored. And these are none of our customs which are inhuman, but all tending to piety and devoted to the preservation of justice. Nor do we conceal those injunctions of ours by which we govern our lives, they being memorials of piety and of friendly conversation among men. And the seventh day we set apart from labor, it is dedicated to the learning of our customs and laws, we thinking it proper to reflect on them as well as on any good thing else in order to our avoiding of sin. So Josephus in talking about the synagogues during the time of Christ and the time before Christ is that it had a twofold purpose. Is that it was, it was set aside to reflect on the laws of God and the customs of God's people so that they might remember it, so that they might keep themselves from sin. And there's no doubt, because of this occurring after the destruction of temple, uh, the first temple, that Solomon was talked about. Look, if we don't remember these things, this is what's going to happen. If we don't remember how God wants to be worshipped, how God has been worshipped by his people, this is the result. Jerusalem destroyed, people dead from starvation or, or being killed during the siege. Again, a lesson for us. We come to the church and it's supposed to be an entertainment center. Since when? We're God's people, right? Now, I'm not going to start preaching or anything. Y'all lucky class is over. But just a lesson for us in the purpose of coming together is to learn God's word how he wants to be taught or how he wants to teach us how we need to learn how the church has learned in the past otherwise look what happens right? any closing thoughts or, or comments